1995, Krista Pike became increasingly envious of her fellow classmate, Colleen Slummer, suspecting that Colleen was trying to steal her boyfriend. In response, Krista plotted a malevolent scheme. She lured Colleen into the woods under the pretext of spending time together, but it soon became evident that Krista had more sinister intentions. This is the story of Krista Pike. I'm Brandy, and welcome back to Killer Bites. In 1995, Krista Pike was 18 years old and was a student at the Job Corps, and she was in a hot and heavy relationship with fellow Job Corps student to Daryl Ship. Pike and Ship were not your average teenagers. They had a bit of a weird and dark side to them. They were both members of a group called the Vampire Clan, which was involved in gothic and occult activities. The group was led by a young man named Rod Farrell, who claimed to be a 500-year-old vampire and went by the name Visago. The Vampire Clan was known for its extreme beliefs and practices, which included drinking each other's blood, engaging in animal sacrifice, and conducting satanic rituals. The vampire clan gained national attention in 1996 when Rod Farrell and a group of other members were arrested in Florida for the murder of the parents of one of the group members. Farrell was convicted and sentenced to death. The case was the subject of a made-for-TV movie called The Vampire Clan. But our story today of Krista Pike starts before all of that. As I said, Pike and Ship were members of this strange and twisted vampire clan. They were active members and participated in the rules and rituals that went along with it. Pike was born March 10th, 1976. Her mother was unable to care for her child at the time, so Pike was raised by her grandparents. In her younger years, Pike was allegedly abused by a friend of the family. Not many details have been given about the alleged abuse, but it's it seemed to have a serious impact on Pike's demeanor and behavior throughout her childhood. Years went by. Pike's grandmother and grandfather passed away. Krista was very close with her grandmother, with both grandparents, and she took it really hard. Pike was never the same after her grandmother died. She started to harm herself, leaving cuts on her body. Once her grandmother had passed away, Pike had to move in with her mother, which sounds like it would be a good thing, but it only made things worse. Pike and her mother, Carissa, did not have a good relationship at all, but Carissa wanted to get help for her daughter, so she brought her in to see a clinical psychologist. But after going to several different clinical psychologists, none of them could provide enough help or care for Pike's mental health needs. She wasn't getting any better. Carissa was no help at home either. She kept a steady flow of bad men coming through the door who would attempt to abuse her daughter, Krista Pike. When Pike turned 18, she enrolled in the Jobs Corps program at the Knoxville campus of the University of Tennessee. Krista Pike was attending Job Corps to study nursing the same profession as her mother. At the university, Pike met Colleen Slemmer. Slemmer was your average student. Friends and family would describe her as a kind and caring person who was always willing to help others. Slemmer was also enrolled in the nursing program at the Knoxville, Tennessee campus. Pike and Slemmer were both students in the same program, but they were definitely not friends. In fact, Pike started to become jealous of Slemmer. She believes that Slemmer was trying to steal her boyfriend away from her. Pike thought that Slemmer was purposefully trying to put the moves on her 17-year-old boyfriend to Daryl Ship. At one point in the school year, Pike went on a trip to travel to see some of her extended family. Her boyfriend, Ship, stayed behind in Knoxville for the holidays. Ship was lonely without Pike around, so he sought out other friends to hang out with while she was gone. Ship started to hang out with Colleen Slemmer, but it didn't end there. They weren't just hanging out. Things turned physical, and Ship and Slemmer hooked up while Pike was away. While the two never told Pike what actually went down, she had her suspicions. Pike's suspicions grew stronger as the days went on, but with no proof or confirmation, she was without relief. She was just driving herself crazy and thinking in circles. Then Pike attempted to create peace with Slemmer. Pike offered up some to Slummer and told her she kept it stashed out in the woods. But this peace offering was just a ruse. Pike didn't actually want to make nice with this woman. She wanted to get some sort of revenge from Slummer. Thursday, January 12th at 8 p.m., Pike, Ship, Slemmer, and a mutual friend, Shadola Peterson, headed out of their dorm rooms and were headed straight for the woods. Slemmer thought that they were going out to the woods to get high and do drugs, but she was in for a much worse fate. 
They were in a remote area. There was nobody around for miles. Once they were far enough out in the woods, and most definitely alone, Pike decided it was time to confront Slemmer. Pike confronted her about trying to seduce her boyfriend. Slemmer was quick to deny that anything happened between her and Ship. Pike continued to poke, prod, and question Slemmer about her suspicious relationship with Ship. Slemmer then realized that they were not out in the woods to have a good time and smoke Pike and Ship both had carried weapons with them out into the woods. They had meat cleavers and box cutters. The other friend with them, Shadola Peterson, was there at the scene and was acting as a lookout. She was on Pike's side of the story, and she made sure no one would walk up on them while confronting Slemmer. Pike then lunged at Slemmer, grabbed her by the head, and pulled her face into contact with her knee. After that, she shoved Slemmer aggressively onto the ground, then repeatedly kicked and punched Slemmer. Slemmer was trying to fight for her life and was desperately trying to defend herself. She was laying in the mud, sobbing when she called out asking, why are you doing this to me? Pike just kept on coming with her brutal attack. At one point, Slemmer attempts to stand up and run away from the group of vicious classmates that she thought were her friends. Slemmer didn't make it very far before Pike sliced her across her back, while Ship stopped her and forced her back onto the ground. Then Pike took out the box cutter and started cutting away at Slemmer over and over again. Slemmer was terrified and pleaded with Pike and Ship to let her live. She tried to bargain with them. She said, if you let me live, I'll quote, walk back to Florida without stopping at Jobs Corps to pick up her stuff. This still didn't satisfy Pike. She did not like what she was hearing. She responded back saying, shut up. The more that Slummer tried to talk, the angrier Pike became. For the next hour, Pike continued her assault. She continued to beat on her and slash her. Ship even used the box cutter and carved a pentagram into Slummer's chest. At one point during the attack, Pike thought she had heard a noise or a person out in the woods interrupting her brutal torture. She stepped away from Slummer and went out to investigate. But after finding no one, she turned back around and went right back to slashing away at Slummer. Pike threw a large rock at Slummer that nailed her right in the back of the head. Then Ship started to join in and began finding and throwing rocks at Slummer. Slummer was in really bad shape at this point. She had low, shallow breathing and was essentially drowning in her own blood. It was a horrible and gruesome scene. After an hour of hell, Pike picked up a huge chunk of asphalt and repeatedly thrust it into Slemmer's skull and from there ultimately ended Colleen Slemmer's life. Once they were sure that Slemmer was no longer alive, Pike and Ship dragged the body to sit on top of a pile of dirt underneath the trees in the woods. Pike then picked up a piece of Slemmer's fractured skull with her hands and put it in her pocket. Like a lot of sick killers out there, Pike wanted to keep a souvenir or a trophy of what she thought was her victory. They took Slemmer's ID, so if the body was found, it would be hard to identify who it was. They also took her black gloves and used them to wipe off the blood from their shoes and their clothes. Then the three left the woods and walked to a nearby gas station and threw away Slemmer's ID and the bloody gloves. Then, just like that, the three of them made their way back to the dorm rooms. It was around 10 p.m. when they finally got back to their dorms. Once back in the dorms, Pike went to visit a friend. The friend recounts that Pike was in high spirits when they were hanging out. Pike was singing, dancing, jumping around, and smiling. Then Pike told her friend the terrible adventures of her night. Pike didn't hold back. She laid out all of the details of what she had done to Colleen Slemmer. And then she whipped out her trophy, a piece of Slemmer's skull, and showed it to her friend. The very next morning, January 13th, Colleen Slemmer's remains were found by an employee of the university in Knoxville. Supposedly, this employee, at first sight, thought he had discovered an animal carcass, but soon realized that it was something much worse. It was an innocent student of the school lying lifeless on the ground. The authorities were called immediately. The officers came as quickly as they could, but they were way too late in saving Colleen Slemmer's life. The first officer on site was horrified at the crime scene and described it saying, I thought I was looking into her face, but everything was so badly mangled, I couldn't be sure. Krista Pike tried to return to the scene of the crime the next morning, but she was denied access to the woods because of the investigation taking place. She turned around and went back to campus. Then, Pike actually leaves her jacket behind in a classroom of the school 
and inside the jacket is the piece of Slemmer's skull. It's like Pike wanted to get caught. Why were you still carrying the skull around, and how could you accidentally just leave that laying around on school campus? An office administrator found the jacket and piece of the skull, and of course, turned it into the police. After that, it was pretty obvious who had committed this crime. Krista Pike, to Daryl Ship, and Shadola Peterson were all arrested. They brought them all in for questioning. Pike went first and came right out with it. She told the officials that she was in fact responsible for the death of her fellow classmate, Colleen Slemmer. Pike gave a long and thorough description of what happened out in the woods. Her confession was actually 42 pages long. The police had more than just her confession though. They also had the piece of skull from her jacket. They found Pike's blood-stained clothing from that night. She even brought the cops back to the gas station where they attempted to dispose of the ID cards and gloves. Pike was very cooperative throughout the whole ongoing process of investigation. The trial for the murder of Colleen Slemmer was highly publicized and took place in Knox County, Tennessee on March 22, 1996. Pike was prosecuted by an assistant Knoxville County District Attorney named Bill Crabtree. Crabtree's opening statement reads that the evidence found for the case is, quote, an act so vile, so heinous, so atrocious, so despicable, as bad or worse as anything you've ever seen in a movie, read in a novel, or dreamed in your worst nightmare. During the trial, prosecutors argued that Pike and her boyfriend to Daryl Ship lured Colleen into the woods and killed her as a part of a plan to prove their loyalty to the vampire clan. The prosecution presented evidence that Pike had used a box cutter to carve a pentagram into Colleen's chest and that she had taken a piece of Colleen's skull as a souvenir. Pike's defense team argued that she was not responsible for the murder due to mental illness and that she had suffered abuse and trauma throughout her lifetime. The defense team brought up Pike's traumatic past experience at the trial, saying, Before her arrest at age 18, Pike had a horrific childhood. Before she was even born, she suffered brain damage. Then, from the time she was a small child, 11, she endured abuse, neglect, multiple violent rapes, and suffered from severe mental illness. With these factors working against her, she was never able to develop into a functional adult. In fact, she was only 18 at the time of the offense. And while she was technically barely legally eligible for the ultimate punishment under current Tennessee law, her immaturity and severe mental illness mandate commutation from execution. However, at the trial, Pike showed no remorse for any of her actions. It was said that her behavior was consistently erratic and violent during the entire trial. The defense also attempted to link the murder to Pike's involvement in the vampire clan and her fascination with gothic and occult culture. Krista Pike was connected to the vampire clan through her relationship with the group's leader, Rod Farrell, whom she had met online. Pike and Farrell became close, and Pike became involved in the group's gothic and occult activities, including drinking animal sacrifices, and conducting satanic rituals. During the investigation into the murder of Colleen Slemmer, authorities discovered that Pike was a member of the vampire clan. They obtained evidence from Pike's room that indicated her involvement in the group, including a book on Satanism, a journal in which she wrote about her fascination with vampires and her desire to become one, and a notebook containing drawings of pentagrams and other occult symbols. They also had found a satanic Bible in her boyfriend Ship's dorm room as well. In addition to the physical evidence, prosecutors presented testimony from other members of the vampire clan who confirmed Pike's involvement in the group's activities. Pike herself admitted to being a member of the group during her trial, although she denied that the the murder of Colleen Slemmer was related to the group's beliefs or practices. While it's unclear how deeply Pike was involved in the vampire clan or how much influence the group had over her, her connection to the group was a significant factor in the investigation and trial of her involvement in the murder. At Pike's trial, Colleen's mother spoke about the impact of her daughter's murder, saying, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think of her, and there's not a day that goes by that I don't miss her terribly. On March 22nd, 
1996, after only a few hours of deliberation, the jury found Pike guilty of first-degree murder, and she was also convicted of aggravated kidnapping and theft of property. The jury recommended the death penalty for Pike, and the judge imposed the sentence. Krista Pike is currently incarcerated at the Tennessee Prison for Women in Nashville, Tennessee. Pike was sentenced to death in 1996 for the murder of Colleen Slummer. She was the youngest woman ever to be sentenced to death in the United States at the time. Pike made several attempts to appeal her sentence over the years, but all of those appeals have been denied. One of Pike's most notable appeals was in 2012, when she argued that her trial attorneys were ineffective and had failed to adequately represent her during the trial. Pike claimed that her attorneys had not presented certain mitigating evidence, such as her history of mental illness and abuse, that could have potentially influenced the jury's decision. But the Tennessee Supreme Court ultimately denied the appeal back back in 2013, ruling that her trial attorneys had definitely provided her with competent representation and that her sentence was in fact a very fair sentence. Pike has continued to file appeals and petitions over the years, but none have been successful in overturning her sentence. Pike will spend the rest of her life behind bars. Pike's accomplice, the boyfriend to Daryl Shipp, was tried separately in court in 1997. Shipp was charged with first-degree murder, aggravated kidnapping, and theft. During the trial, the prosecution argued that Ship had played an active role in the murder and had participated in the torture and mutilation of Slemmer's body. The defense, on the other hand, argued that Ship had only been a bystander and had not played a direct role in the murder. However, the jury was not buying what the defense was selling. They could see right through it. The jury ultimately sided with the prosecution and found Ship guilty on all charges. Ship was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, as he was a minor at the time of the crime, so he was not eligible for the death penalty. He is currently serving a life sentence at the Northeast Correctional Complex in Mount in City, Tennessee. Then there is the accomplice, the lookout, Shadola Peterson, who was tried in court. Peterson received a much lighter sentence that I think is entirely unfair. I think Peterson got off way too easy. During Peterson's trial, the prosecution argued that Peterson had been a willing participant in the murder and had helped to plan and carry out the crime. The defense, however, argued that Peterson had only played a very minor role in the murder and that she had been coerced by Krista Pike into participating. Peterson was sentenced to probation because she agreed to being an informant against Pike and Ship. Peterson did plead guilty to being an accessory to murder after the fact. I'm glad Krista Pike and her accomplices are behind bars, but that hasn't stopped Pike from stirring up trouble. She is still raising hell, even behind bars. In 2001, Pike attempted to kill again. August 24, 2001, a fire broke out in a wing of the prison, which prompted employees to move one of the prisoners, last name Jones, into an exercise cage that also happened to contain Pike and another inmate, Cornette. Jones and Cornette didn't get along at all. Pike jumped in to defend her friend Cornette immediately. Pike took a bootlace and began choking Jones. She told investigators that she flipped the inmate over, who weighed more than 200 pounds at the time, onto her stomach. Then she sat on top of her and continued to choke her. Officers finally intervened, which saved Jones' life. Pike would later tell an investigator, I don't want to say that I intended to kill her, but I would say that I didn't care if she died. I wouldn't lose any sleep over it if she did. However, after the incident occurred, Pike was on the phone with her mother, sounding much more determined to kill Jones than she had led on to the investigators. Records show she said in the recorded conversation, and I wrapped that shoestring around her and tried to choke the life out of her. Pike continued by saying, she was passed out on the ground, mama, twitching, foaming at the mouth. Her eyeballs were bugged out. So far, her eyelids were flipped up. I bet you if she gets near me, I'm gonna do it again. I'm gonna succeed this time. Pike was convicted of attempted murder and a 25 year sentence was then added to her death term. So that's one crazy incident from Pike's life behind bars, but there's even more. Then in March of 2012, it seems that Pike had made plans to escape from prison, which involved corrections officer Justin Heflin and a New Jersey man named Donald Kohut. Yes, you are hearing that correctly. 
Krista Pike was attempting a prison break. It was never officially determined how it all began, but Kohut, who worked as a personal trainer in his early 30s, entered into a letter writing correspondence with Pike, which began around the start of 2011. By July of that year, Kohut was making the close to 1,800 mile round trip from Fleming to New Jersey to Nashville, Tennessee to visit Pike in person on visiting days once or twice a month. Eventually, Kohut communicated a plan for her escape to Pike and enlisted the help of corrections officer Heflin, who agreed to participate in return for cash and gifts. It was in early 2012. Prison personnel received a tip of information about the escape plot. The joint efforts of the Tennessee Department of Corrections, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, and the New Jersey State Police prevented the attempted prison break from being successful. The Tennessee Bureau of Investigation reported that the plan was discovered before it had progressed very far, and that the escape was not considered to be imminent. You might be wondering, is Krista Pike and Tadaryl Ship still in a relationship? What I do know is that Pike has reached out to Ship while behind bars. She wrote him a letter saying, Please write me. I miss you so much. You see what I get for trying to be nice to the I went ahead and bashed her brains out so she died quickly instead of letting her bleed to death and suffer more. Please write me and tell me what you're feeling. Also, tell your lawyer if he wants me to testify for you. I will. Love you for the rest of my life. Lil Devil. I'm not sure of their current relationship status. Slemmer's family was absolutely devastated by the news of her untimely death. Friends and family, they loved Colleen so much, and she was taken from them way too soon. In an interview, Slemmer's mother, Mae Martinez, spoke out and said, Honestly, my heart breaks every single day because I keep reliving it and reliving it. She desperately wanted to seek justice for her daughter and fought hard to put Pike and her accomplices behind bars. My heart goes out to the friends, loved ones and all those affected by Colleen Slummer's death. What is sick is that there were warning signs that this death was going to happen and nobody did anything about it. A few days before this horrible incident, Tadaro told some friends he had to make a human sacrifice because the celestial bodies were in alignment. Also before this horrible incident, Pike had actually confided in a friend, telling her plan to murder Colleen Slummer and that she was just feeling mean that day. So there are two people admitting they had had plans and every intention to commit a heinous crime and nobody came forward or told the police about it? It's absolutely horrible what happened to Colleen Slummer. Her death was so brutal and drawn out. No one should have to suffer the way she did. And she was being punished for hooking up with Tadaryl? Meanwhile, Krista Pike doesn't seem to want to murder her boyfriend Tadaryl, who played an equal part in this situation, which makes no sense. I mean, he's the one who cheated here. And she isn't mad at him? She's just mad at Slummer? And then he joins in on harming this poor girl. And don't get me started on the friend who's a lookout. How could you be okay with something like that? They all deserve a harsh punishment. I think life in prison is certainly fair under these circumstances. And honestly, I don't think this is the last time we'll be hearing about Krista Pike. As long as Pike is alive, she will continue to be violent and take her anger and violence out on other people. But enough about what I think. What do you guys at home think about this case? Do you think Krista Pike will attempt to kill again? Let me know in the comments down below. I'm Brandy, and thank you for watching another episode of Killer Bites. Stay safe out there, and we'll see you next time.